All right, so today we're going to talk about geomorphic agents. So last time we talked about geomorphology generally, which is the idea that landscapes change over time, and we can study that change um, to learn about how it occurs. And we mentioned endogenic forces, forces from within the earth, often related to te plate tectonics, and volcanism and earthquake activity related to that that can create uplift in landscapes. And then we talked about other forces like weathering that tear these landscapes down over time. We said these forces are always kind of competing with one another um, as landscapes rise and landscapes fall and they change over time. And we mentioned some examples of things that might be involved in that weathering process and today we're going to spend some more time thinking about these kinds of agents of this weathering process or geomorphic change and these things are called geomorphic agents. So a definition of that is a medium that erodes, transports, and deposits earth materials and these are things like rivers, ice, wind, waves, and so most of these are kind of associated with um, some sort of water or air fluid and they are responsible for carrying a lot of sediment and rock and other things around to different places and redistributing them over time. Um, here's a picture of a boulder um, that's sitting in this kind of precarious position on the edge of a cliff and this boulder is an example of what we call a glacial erratic which is a rock that was left behind as a big ice sheet, a big glacier melted, um, and the glacier carried the rock into this particular position and left it behind, and it kind of looks um, very out of place in the landscape because um, you know it wasn't originally there, but was carried into this position by that type of geomorphic agent. So um, we're gonna talk specifically about rivers and ice and wind. Um, so fluvial systems is a kind of official name for river systems. And river systems are very, very important in transporting sediment. Stream flow accounts for 85 to 90% of all the transport of sediment into ocean basins. And you, we've all probably seen rivers, particularly in flood stages where the rivers are chocked full with lots of sand and sediment, they look very brown. Um, a lot of times rivers uh, might look almost even red if they're carrying a lot of red types of sediments. And so we've seen this kind of process play out. And we also know that rivers move and meander over time as their um, channels change. And that's another example of how they're picking up and scooping up more sediment as they erode out new channels um, that they'll travel through on their journey down to the ocean. So this uh, little video on loop is showing um, the transformation of this particular river over a couple decades. Um, and we can see how it's picking up new sediment and from new locations as it's continuing to move out to the ocean. Um, so other examples that can help us appreciate um, just how much sediment is moved by these rivers um, are some examples of big rivers that we're familiar with. So the Mississippi River um, in the kind of eastern or central part of the country carries over 500 million tons of sediment to the ocean each year. And we can see pictures of all that sediment being dumped into the ocean um, from space. So you can see where the river mouth is in this picture on the upper left, and you can see how dirty the water is around that location. And that's all the sediment being dumped into the ocean. Um, another extreme example of this is the Grand Canyon. So the Colorado River that flows through the Grand Canyon is responsible for carving that canyon. Um, and over hundreds of thousands of years, it has eroded and carried all the material that used to fill in that steep canyon out and dumped it into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's a lot of work that that particular river was able to achieve. So when we look at rivers, we know that the speed of the river is very important in determining how effective that river will be at carrying sediment. And over time, um, even before rivers make it all the way out to the ocean, 
They go through several cycles of picking up and depositing sediment along the way. The river is able to scoop up more sediments and then in places where the river slows down it's going to deposit sediments into different kinds of point bars or beaches. Um, and so as a river bends um, and you know winds one way to another uh, that process actually slows down the river and causes the river to deposit sediments in certain locations along its banks. So if you look at this particular picture below you can see that the river flow is flowing from the bottom of the slide towards the top of the slide. And there's places where the river is scooping up new sediment. Um, and in, that, in those locations, the river is flowing in a fairly straight direction. And then when the river hits a bend and has to turn around, that bending causes the river to slow down. And that sediment that was scooped up gets deposited downstream. And as the river straightens out, it scoops up material on the opposite bank um, where the water is moving quickly. And then when it has to turn the corner again, it deposits that sediment. And it's basically kind of leapfrogging over time, depositing sediment a little bit downstream, a little bit downstream, a little bit downstream, and eventually it's working its way out to the ocean. So one problem that we have experienced a lot uh, in the last century is that humans have worked hard to control rivers and they've worked hard to also straighten the path that rivers travel on to try to keep rivers out of their yards, out of their agricultural properties, you know, out of their industrial properties, etc. And so there's been a lot of effort to straighten out channels and take out these na natural meanders or bends. And unfortunately, this problem has created another problem, which is that it's led to what we call channel incision, or kind of the cutting of river channels deeper and deeper down into the ground um, so that they're not very close to the surface of the land, which is the original position that not all but many rivers um, would have occupied. So the idea is that as we straighten channels, we take out those bends where, as we discussed in the last slide, the water slows down. And so this faster moving water is allowed to pick up and erode more sediment more effectively. And as it does that, it's not only eroding sediment from the sides of the banks, but also eroding sediment from the bottom of the river. And so the channel gets deeper, and as the channel gets deeper um, or incised, then this problem is exacerbated as now it's definitely not meandering and spilling out on the surface, encountering vegetation that might slow the water down. So it's continuing to move quickly, continuing to erode very effectively, move lots of sediment off the site, and incise itself even farther. So um, this is a problem for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that traditionally rivers were very important distributors of nutrients around their floodplains. So floodplains are the areas on the sides of rivers um, where water um, during high flow events will spill over on the surface and water the landscape and also deposit certain kinds of sediments and fish poop and algae and other things that might be in the river on the river banks and that acts kind of as a fertilizer for the organisms that grow there. Um, but if we have incised channels, that process is no longer happening. The other thing is that as the water in the surface of the river drops deeper and deeper into an incised channel, that means the water availability to plants and plants roots at the surface is going to be increasingly um, you know, far away. So if you look at the diagram in the bottom left hand of the slide, you can see the kind of landscape in a more normal stream channel and you can hopefully see that the height of the surface of the river is close to the height of the ground. And then also that blue line showing the height of the river extends underneath the ground on both sides and that kind of shows the level of the groundwater. And so the groundwater would be close to the ground surface and plants would have access to water and would be able to live along the side of the riverbanks. 
But then below, when the channel has become incised, the depth of the groundwater is closer to the uh, height of the stream channel, which is now quite a bit farther below the ground surface. And so this means dry soil, um, death of plants, and transition of plant communities that were also previously kind of holding the site in place, and this can exacerbate erosion problems as well. Okay, another important thing to know about rivers is that over time as they carve out um, sediments and carry them off site, they tend to create classic V-shaped valleys. So here's an example of a picture in Hawaii, and you can see that as this river has been eroding this mountain landscape over time, it has cut down and created a big valley, just like the Grand Canyon or the Feather River Canyon. And from this perspective, you can see that the shape of the valley is a classic V. And so we'll learn about a little bit later that this is different than the kind of um, landscape features that we see when glaciers are involved in cutting out valleys. Okay, so that brings us to glaciers. So glaciers are large ice sheets, a large frozen body of ice that's constantly moving under its own weight as a plastic solid. We've talked about plastic solids before. These are things that aren't fully sloshing around, but they have a little bit of flexibility and they move a little bit over time. You might remember the asthenosphere that we talked about before. And glaciers, these big ice sheets that are slowly moving across the landscape over time, experience different kinds of processes. Um, one is called the expansion or advance of glaciers, where they're expanding and getting bigger over time. It's usually associated with cold climate events. And then they can also contract, which is sometimes called retreat, or they can be deflated over time. And this is, of course, usually associated with warm climatic events. And these glaciers that exist on our Earth today contain the largest pool of fresh water on the planet. So the majority of the fresh water that we have um, is contained in this ice. And as we've seen over the past several decades, as a lot of this ice is melting and entering the ocean, um, it's kind of changing the dynamics of not only geomorphology, the look of the landscapes, but also things like sea level rise, um, climate, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the pictures of an ice sheet from the side where it meets the ocean. And then on the right, you can see a picture of a glacier um, as it exists in a big glacial valley. And you can see that it almost looks like a really big river. And remember that these ice sheets are actually moving over time um, and in that way are very much like rivers. So um, as we said, that glaciers are moving like rivers and it's important to understand that just like water, the, the frozen water that's in the glaciers is always going to be moving downhill. It's going to be moving according to the force of gravity, which is pulling that material down towards the earth and towards the earth's core. So even as glaciers are getting smaller, the movement of the glacier and the individual water molecules within the glacier is always going to continue to be in that downhill direction. Um, and also, it's just important to continue to think about the fact that they really are dynamic features that are moving across a landscape over time. And it's that movement that allows them to be very effective geomorphic agents. Um, this picture is of Glacier National Park in Montana. And this park um, famously or infamously has been losing its glaciers over time. So you can see a picture on the left of one of its glaciers, the Shepherd Glacier in 1913 and 2005. And this uh, much of the ice that started up high towards the glacier um, melted and also even before it melted was flowing down the hill slope um, and eventually melting and disappearing from the landscape. 
Okay, but it's this movement of the glaciers that allows them to be effective geomorphic agents or effective eroders of geologic or earth material. So we call the process when glaciers pick up rocks plucking, so these big ice sheets pick up a lot of loose debris. That loose debris gets frozen in the bottom of the glacier or plucked. And then as that ice continues to flow plastically across the surface, it leads to a lot of abrasion or it's scraping um, of the rocks and landscapes below. So it can um, scrape landscapes completely clean of soil, remove all the soil and vegetation that might have originally been there. And then it can also actually scrape and start to scratch away and eat away at rocks. So the lines that are created in rocks by glaciers are called striations. And these striations, one, tell us that glaciers existed in a particular area, and they can also show us the direction that a glacier was traveling. So the images on the right side of the slide are examples of these glacial striations. And the impact is that over time, as glaciers exist um, in these areas on the landscape and continue to move, they erode away these big U-shaped channels. So often these U-shaped channels will start out as V-shaped channels, and then as the climate cools, areas that might have contained water originally may start to contain glaciers, and as the glaciers move through those ancient V-shaped valleys, they reshape them into these big U's. So I have three photographs here showing some different big arcing U-shaped valleys, and probably the picture on the left is something that you've seen before. It's a view of Yosemite Valley, which is a glacially shaped or U-shaped valley. And in this particular case, the glacier was powerful enough to actually scrape off part of this big granitic dome and leave half of it behind. So that's what half dome is, um, kind of one side of this big U-shaped valley. So um, when glaciers start to retreat, when they melt um, over time in warmer climate conditions, they leave behind all the debris that they've plucked up and been moving across the landscape with him, with them. And we have a name for this material. It's called till or glacial till. And this material is characterized by the fact that it's really unsorted, meaning there's lots of big pieces mixed with small pieces and jagged pieces, um, you know, right next to smooth pieces. Um, and so we call that unsorted material. And not only do we have these big piles of unsorted material, but we tend to have these big piles of unsorted material forming particular shapes around the locations where the glaciers um, would have been sitting for certain amounts of time. So these big hills of till, which rhymes, are called moraines. Um, and these big hills of till are deposited along the edge of glaciers where they sit for certain amounts of time. Um, and so you can see on the far left a kind of diagram of how these big moraines may built up. And then you can also see in the middle a picture of what this actually kind of looks like on the landscape. Um, these big moraines can be huge up to 60 meters in height. So like 100, close to 150 feet in height. It's pretty big. Um, so these are significant features, not just small piles of rubble and debris. Um, so many of you guys um, probably know that our climate has been experiencing a warming period for about the last 10,000 years. And if we went back 10,000 years ago, we would see a world that was a lot colder than today. And that world would have been covered with a lot more ice and basically a lot more glaciers than the earth that we see today. So this image shows us the extent of what we call the Pleistocene glaciers. The Pleistocene is a name for a period of geologic time that extends from about 1.8 million years ago um, up to the last glacial maximum about 10,000 years ago. And you can see that large parts of North America, all around the Great Lakes, um, all around New England, and parts of Montana, Washington, um, 
would have been all covered with glaciers at that time. And so all of these areas, and, and also including other high elevation areas in the Cascades, Rockies, and the Sierra Mountains, um, were very influenced by glaciers relatively recently. And so we have lots of evidence of that through till, through striations, through these U-shaped valleys um, that these glaciers have left behind. Okay, so um, another uh, type of geomorphic agent is the wind. And the official term or technical term for wind is aeolian. So systems that are primarily shaped by wind are aeolian systems. And wind is an important geomorphic agent that moves material in certain kinds of climates and certain kinds of environments very effectively. But it's generally much less powerful um, than water. So it's a lot less dense than water and it's not quite as good at moving materials around. And generally what we see when we have landscapes that are um, created by the movement of particles by wind is that we see these classic ripple shapes on the landscape. And these ripples exist at different scales. So we see big dunes, sand dunes for instance, um, where there's kind of large scale repeated patterns of hills and valleys. But then even within the dunes, we see kind of smaller scale ripples, as you can see on the picture on the right, and the position of these ripples and the position of the dunes themselves is constantly moving over time as the wind is picking up the particles on one side of the ripple and then depositing them on the far side of the ripple. And I have um, a little video about that that I will show you guys um, or I'll post um, next to the PowerPoint for you guys to watch. So the other thing to know about wind that's very important is even though it's not super powerful in and of itself, um, it has the ability to carry particles very, very long distances. So a lot of particles that are picked up, for instance, in the Sahara Desert in Northern Africa are carried all the way across the Atlantic Ocean until they are deposited in places like the Amazon Basin many thousands of miles away. And so, again, while wind might not be um, carrying um, as much sediment in any given place, it's still a very effective and very important um, distributor of material over long periods of time. So let me sh play this quick video clip so you can see how these different types of uh, materials are moved by wind over time. Urban. It's from the oh, other geomorphic agents that exist on the landscape as well, but those three, the surface water, the ice, and the wind are three of the main forces that are continuing to shape the landscape over time. All right, have a nice afternoon.